Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Robert Tomatza, and today it's with great pleasure that my guest is Chief Executive and Curator of the Palestine Exploration Fund, also known as PEF. The Palestine Exploration Fund is certainly known to many scholars, probably all scholars, working particularly in the history of the late 19th century Palestine. But I'm sure that if you've been around Jerusalem and other locations in Palestine, you probably bump into some of the plaques describing mostly archaeological uh, sites. The Palestine Exploration Fund was funded under the royal patronage of Queen Victoria in 1865 and essentially established what we now call biblical archaeology throughout Palestine with a number of very important excavations, which we will be discussing later, in Jerusalem. But first of all, Felicity. Welcome. Thank you, Roberto. Felicity, the first question I have is very much about your career. How did you become the chief executive and curator of the Palestine Exploration Fund? (laughs) Well, it was a bit by accident. Um, I was um, a recent graduate from Bristol University and I was temping fairly close by to where the PEF was then located in central London. And it was a great place to temp because I could go and hang out at the PEF in my lunch break and make a nuisance of myself. And so when a job opportunity first came up, I was the kind of in the right place. Does that make sense? And it, it's literally just as, uh, as ad hoc as that. So it was by accident, but mm-hmm. uh, um, I, I was wondering about uh, your previous knowledge, if you had any knowledge whatsoever of uh, Palestine, particularly the archaeological dimension, and uh, how did you feel when you start engaging with the history of such a fascinating and certainly rich history of, uh, of, of Palestine? Well, my main um, area of interest previously had been in the Aegean, Minoan and Mycenaean archaeology. Um, but I had done some voluntary work at the British Museum in their Middle East department. So I'd got a bit, I'd got to know about Palestine, Jordan, uh, Syria. A little bit. And when I came to the PEF, though, the thing that I was, um, I found very quickly was that I had to brush up on my modern, more modern history. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to function. I wouldn't be able to understand anything of the material that I was dealing with, which was as much to do with the late Ottoman um, period, the First World War and the Mandate period, as it was to do with the early Bronze Age in the Jordan Valley. The PEF is famous because essentially brought what we call biblical archaeology to Palestine. I mean, this idea of digging around uh, uh, Palestine as a whole, certainly around Jerusalem, in order to find uh, locations and uh, archaeological uh, remains connected to the Bible. And so I was wondering if you can give us a sense of the uh, uh, you know, early history of, of the fund, how it developed, and uh, sort of the goals that were set by the, by the fund itself, uh, particularly of the mid 19th century. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, straight from the outset, I think this idea of biblical archeology span as being something that PEF did is a bit, a bit of a red herring. They were certainly, um, a lot of them were very much motivated by biblical history and wanting to understand it. Um, and a lot of people were very were what we would describe as evangelical in that. But as an organization, we were much more driven by science and the um, idea of getting reliable information, regardless of what that reliable information was. And very, very quickly, and this is what actually looking in the archives tells you, as opposed to the publications, is that skepticism comes in very, very quickly. Um, it was quite clear that you know the glories of Solomon were not suddenly going to make themselves known. And rather than implode and go away and have a bit of a crisis of identity, they dealt with it. 
they said, okay, that's what's there. Not, not a lot, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's what's there instead. How they presented that to their readership, their public is another matter. And I guess this is very important to remember the fact that there is a, a division between the professional uh, working on the ground and of course this idea of propagating uh, information related to the findings of these excavations. Now, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, the coming of the PEF. Now, the survey of the city, commissioned in 1865, uh, which has become a milestone in the study of the city itself, since it provided some sort of a first uh, modern map of Jerusalem, produced with uh, scientific methods, uh, basically helped the creation of the PEF itself. And I was wondering if you can tell us how do we move from the ordinance to the PEF and why are the people involved? And more importantly, where did they get the money from? So essentially, how was it uh, uh, funded? It's a very interesting uh, question because, and it gets to the heart of what the PEF is about, because it was never an official organization. It was an independent organization from the outset. So no one body, organization, interest group is pulling our strings. Um, now, the Ordnance Survey of Jerusalem, just to backtrack a little bit, um, was done uh, ostensibly to furnish the um, facts, as it were, for the um, installation of a water supply. And the money that was raised for that came uh, in part from a lady called Baroness Angela Burdett Coots, she of the banking firm. And she's responsible in London for um, the installation of lots of water fountains supplying clean water. If you think about it, it's not so long since um, cholera was identified as a waterborne disease. And this had a huge impact on the infrastructure of London, the sewers were built, and these water fountains started being um, put in place by philanthropists all up and down the country. And people like Angela Burdett Coots were very interested in doing something similar elsewhere and where better than the Holy City. It makes kind of ideological sense, I suppose you could say, clean water for the Holy City. It's a great kind of rallying call. And so the man behind raising the money was a chap called George Grove. Um, he's a typical kind of Victorian Renaissance man, does everything. He's an engineer by training, but he's also a musicologist and he's also a Hebrew scholar. You know, why do you one job when you can do three? And um, he said, you know what, clean water supply for the Holy City, that's a great idea, Angela, but we need to do a survey first. And so that's how he got her involved in the Ordnance Survey. And it was his friend, a chap called uh, Captain Charles Wilson of the Royal Engineers, who carried out the work on the ground. And so that's where you see these people coming together. The other important person at this point in time is Dean Arthur Stanley of Westminster. And he was a friend of George Groves as well. And George Groves had written the Hebrew Concordance for some of his books. Um, there's a particular book, Sinai and Palestine, that Stanley wrote, which was really important. And so these guys knew each other and they had wanted to get an organization to further study the, the Holy Land, for want of a better phrase, um, up and, up and running for some time, but there wasn't the, the will in the UK for that kind of investigation. Unlike in other parts of Europe, there were, you know, we had, we had lost that tradition of pilgrimage perhaps, and it, that in itself had become associated with, let's say, idolatry, the kind of Catholic traditions. And so people have kind of not seen the point, but the Ordnance Survey acted as a catalyst to get people reignited, reinterested in their relationship with the Holy Land, the land of the Bible, and to want to understand it in a way that was, I suppose, in line with that kind of Victorian scientific drive. So we, um, uh, George Grove and Dean Arthur Stanley worked to kind of uh, pull together lots of people. We've got a fantastic archive consisting of about 80 letters saying, yes, I'll join or no, don't bother me ever again or, oh, okay, but I can't believe I'm sitting on the same committee as him, you know, and all sorts of lovely letters, um, and some of them saying, I won't join, but I'm going to give some money, and so on and so forth, and they're from individuals, and these individuals are um, uh, come from all corners of Victorian society, so you have scientists, natural historians, you have 
architects, you have antiquarians like um, uh, Austin Layard, for example, and you have lots and lots of clerics, archbishops down to lowly reverends and, um, uh, uh, and so on. And you have politicians and soldiers as well. So it's a real kind of who's who of Victorian England uh, embedded in this early society, each with their own take on what this organization is going to do. And for some, it's going to be, ah, we can be our ears on the inside of the Ottoman Empire. For another group of people, it'll be, we can, we can, we can find more about the, the, the path that our lords trod. Isn't that wonderful? And for other people, it'll be, I want to know more about the birds. <laughs> so really that broad and that um, uh, eclectic in its appeal, that was its strength, but it also meant that the people running the PEF had a heck of a juggling act. We will go back to talk about the question of uh, politics, uh, particularly the role of the war office and its relation with the PF later. But, uh, but I'm curious about here the question of uh, uh, water, because obviously mm. you mentioned that uh, this is the reason why we have a, a survey in place. Uh, but eventually, actually, water became very important as it was like, probably the first uh, important uh, uh, discovery of, uh, of a PF, uh, in particular Warren as they discovered the uh, ancient sort of uh, water uh, conducts and aqueducts of, of Jerusalem. And I, and I was wondering if you give us a sense of the magnitude of the discoveries made by the excavations carried out by the PEF. Well, I think, I think the PEF is, is, is so important for the whole of Palestine, as you say, and particularly for Jerusalem, um, in that... Uh, because there was an element of really trying to do things scientifically, um, I think that the results which were published, and which were available to everybody in the end in the Survey of Western Palestine volumes, those uh, researchers, particularly first of all by Charles Warren and then later on um, by um, Bliss and Dickey, um, and then later on still by people like um, uh, Kathleen Kenyon and in between perhaps less so wonderfully by McAllister. Um, the, but particularly with the Warren work and the Bliss work that, that because it was well documented and the data was, was carefully um, uh, 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 recorded, um, it meant that the, the data could be relied upon to a certain degree, which other, had not been the case previously. I mean, what was really behind the, the inspiration for the PEF was that people didn't know enough. It was quite clear to people like Dean Stanley and George Grove that the information that they had on the Holy Land as a whole was bitty. It was um, contradictory. Some people's accounts were better than others and, you know, there wasn't a kind of holistic approach to looking at the region and trying to make sense of it holistically. And the same could be said in microcosm, you could say for Jerusalem in particular, that they wanted to understand it as a whole, warts and all, and difficulties and all. And that's really what they were trying to get at. And they understood that, you know, you couldn't favor a particular interest one way or the other, if you wanted your results to be reliable, you had to record everything, um, which is an approach which hasn't always been um, applied in Jerusalem. Now, that's not to say that they weren't particularly interested in the biblical bits. Yes, they were by their own interests, but also because that's what would bring in the money. And that's very, very important for an independent society. So it's a very, it's a bit of a schizophrenic relationship that the PEF has with its public, with the truth, whatever that is, the facts, with history. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, they, they play an interesting game. Yeah, I have so many questions in my mind now that I've wrote down and I'm trying actually to make sense of, uh, you know, try to follow a, a, a path here. Because obviously, you know, when we talk about excavations uh, in Jerusalem, we're talking about uh, complications because mm. whether it's nowadays for more political reasons, certainly back in the 19th century, uh, excavating Jerusalem would have had uh, uh, an impact uh, on the religious communities of the city. 
And uh, we know the PF was the first one to engage in serious digging, particularly around the, uh, uh, the area of uh, the Arama Sharif or mm -hmm. Temple Mount. And, and effectively, probably the only one to date that it basically moved into the area and excavated the area. And, and I was wondering if you can give us a sense of uh, these early operations and how the PF also manage their relationship with the uh, local communities. And what is the legacy of, of that excavation? I think that's a very interesting and quite complicated question with an in equally interesting and complicated answer. I mean, on the face of it, um, we did everything correctly as, as much as we possibly could as well. You know, we got our commissions from Constantinople. We um, negotiated with the people in Constantinople, but Constantinople is a long way from Jerusalem. And so when Warren turned up in Jerusalem, and don't forget, he was young. He was only about 23 years old, you know? He was a young guy with all this responsibility. <laughs> um, he found that the um, local authorities were perhaps less enthusiastic. I think that's fair to say. So he had to, they had to work a way to carry out their work without um, uh, upsetting the, the local authorities and indeed the local inhabitants too much. And, you know, what their concerns were, were, were valid. You know, I think there's one of the, um, you know, what they were doing, the, what, what Warren was doing was digging right next to this immensely holy site, um, a place which the local population felt incredibly strongly about and incredibly proud about for, um, uh, and, and so the local authorities were concerned, I think is one way of putting it. And um, I think that we back in London, as it were, the PFEC in London was perhaps not entirely um, uh, understanding of, of this difficulty that Warren found himself in, um, but others who had done a little bit of exploring themselves had a little bit of a more understanding about the situation. And there was one explorer um, uh, who calls himself Rob Roy or his canoe, Rob Roy, uh, John McGregor. He was he went down the River Jordan in a canoe. Um, there's a story. <laughs> You've got time for that one. And he said, well, you know, how would we feel if uh, how would the Bishop of Westminster feel if the Ottoman Sultan turned up with a bunch of his soldiers and started digging in the lawn outside the abbey? You know, so, <laughs> you know, this is not an unreasonable um, uh, a situation to be a bit alarmed about. And so Warren, he was a young guy. I think he mellows with age. Um, he becomes a little bit more sensible with age, but he wants to make his mark and he wants to show who's in charge a little bit. And I get the feeling that perhaps he, um, he, he went in a little bit all guns blazing to start with, um, but found a way through. Um, the local inhabitants and his relationship with them, it's interesting because this is, I mean, we're talking about, what, 1870s? This is at the, the height of the British colonial era. And whatever is written about local inhabitants anywhere in the world at this time has got, has got to be seen through that lens. So his opinion about the locals, it's not um, appalling all the time, but it is patronizing. Certainly. However, he does recognize the incredible skill and bravery of the men working with him. And he acknowledges in his writing, he says, you know, it wouldn't have happened without them because they were completely nuts, basically going down these shafts with things falling around them all the time. They were incredibly brave, but incredibly skillful. And so he does recognize their skill. But as to their agency in the project, it doesn't really exist. I found fascinating when you were talking about how young uh, Warren mm -hmm. was, and it made me think that he's essentially he's the same generation as uh, uh, T. Lawrence a few years later. So these are young individuals who just left college and they have this mm -hmm. sense of adventure. And certainly this is the way they saw Palestine and the rest of the world through their eyes of highly educated British uh, young men who essentially mm -hmm. could uh, do anything they wanted, really. Uh, yeah. And I think this is an important aspect to remember that certainly mm -hmm. there's politics behind it, but also there's the agency of young individuals who yeah. just probably were doing it for themselves. Yeah, and, they, and they want to make their mark. They're ambitious. 
And yes, you're absolutely right. You know, the world is their oyster. They're British. They're clever. You know, they 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 can do what they want, and they do, and they do it in a way which you know today perhaps we would look at them and say, "Who the hell do you think you are?" <laughs> Different standards, indeed. I want to bring you to the question of politics. So, in 1875, famously, uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury during the annual general meeting of the PDF, basically made a claim that Palestine was an empty land. And essentially, that served the purpose of later Zionists to coin this famous uh, image of uh, essentially a land without a people uh, for a people without a land. That became obviously a landmark uh, Zionist motto. And I was wondering, you know, since you are actually working within the organization, what is your sense of this relationship between the PEF and uh, the British government? I mean, we understand that the PEF was independent, but still it, it worked uh, somehow as an unofficial branch for the co- sort of the colonial activities of, of the British government. And I was wondering also what the material that you have in, in the archives of the PEF may suggest about this relationship. Well, I think it's very important to note that the Earl of Shaftesbury never went and did any field work in Palestine. And that's the important distinction. Um, And again, he's a member of the PEF. Yes, he's an important member, but his voice is not that of the PEFs. And this is the thing that I think has been misunderstood by a lot of historians who are working only from the published material, is that they do not understand that the PEF as an organization had a different life from the life of them, its membership. And however, having said that, I do think that it is undeniable that a number of important PEF people did hold aspirations for um, uh, a colonial uh, future for Palestine within the milieu of the Western world as opposed to the Ottoman world. First of all, by um, see and seeing uh, Jewish resettlement there as a means of achieving that. Firstly, I think that was because the people who went out and uh, worked there, they felt that the um, Ottoman Empire had neglected this part of the world rather a lot. And they saw this as a way to invigorate the area. They noted, for example, people like Warren and Condor in particular, they noted that um, families were quite depleted of its young men who were taken off and conscripted into the army. And so this wasn't necessarily an empty land scenario because there they were recording what was going on with the people who lived there. But in the hands of somebody like the Earls of Shaftesbury, it becomes a very simple um, statement, doesn't it? Um, So I think there were people, Warren certainly, Condor certainly, who had support for the idea of a Jewish settlement to first of all, reinvigorate the land. And then as when time went on, that, that relationship with a more directly colonial aspiration, it became a useful tool to achieve that goal. That being said, again, they're speaking as individuals. When they write these things, they're not writing um, for the PEF. They're writing in independent um, uh, journals like the, the Jewish Chronicle, for example, which uh, conduct publishes in quite a lot and Warren in his underground Jerusalem that's where he really kind of goes to town on this idea of of um you know seeing Palestine as a a place where let's say the Indian model (laughs) might be might be employed because of course we did such a lovely job there Um, and uh so they have these views but they are very careful not to put them within the Palestine within the PEF's own output it's sort of different Um, and Condor's articles in the Jewish Chronicle are then republished in the pages of the PEQ, interestingly, our journal, but as published first in the Jewish Chronicle. So it's, it's a kind of, um, I think there's, there's no doubt in saying it doesn't exist, but it's not direct. And we're always slightly careful not to make it our, the official opinion. So there's some sort of distance between the uh, little, uh, sort of yeah. official yeah, and, and their work. But certainly, when, when we think about figures like uh, uh, Lord, I mean Kitchener, uh, that was part of the PF and eventually became the Minister of War during World War One, it kind of becomes like uh, you know a very simple equation to think that that maps uh, 
that survey of Palestine and of the various cities of Palestine, including Jerusalem, might have had some sort of a military and political value, uh, even though they were drawn decades earlier. Uh, oh, I think they had a huge value. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. I think you want, well, I think see, the way to see the PEF is not just one thing, it's many things to many different people, always has been and always will be. And so, yes, these maps were made by military people with their military heads on, but they were working for the PEF. And the PEF's job was to try and understand this part of the world better. The fact that it was really useful to a lot of people is um, something that is true. You know, you can't deny it, but that's, it's also useful to a lot of other people for completely different reasons. And that it remains useful to even more people than it was initially even imagined to be. And I guess this is a point where many scholars uh, often uh, take, uh, uh, you know, biblical archaeology uh, as some sort of a, you know, weaponized uh, uh, discipline by by politicians that might have been born out of a true and, and certainly genuine attempt to find uh, connections with biblical artifacts and locations, but eventually that became a discipline connected to uh, military and political purposes. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering if, he, you know, there's any sense of uh, perhaps not self-criticism, but understanding by some of the figures in the PF that their work is not just uh, archaeological or scientific, but actually it's connected to a uh, sort of colonial presence or uh, for future reference? Oh, I think they, they understood that this was part of the, the, part of the bargain, um, if you can see it in that way. They had their own reasons. The people who set it up had their own reasons, but they understood that if they were to get anything done, they had to engage with people who had the skill sets and people who had the resources. And that was the British government and the British military. So it's no mistake, it's no surprise that George Grove, his mate, Charles Wilson, is the one who establishes this enduring relationship with the Royal Engineers. And it's those guys who do this fantastic work in Jerusalem and in Palestine and Jordan as well, um, that gives the PEF its reputation for reliability. But because we're an independent agency, we can go to the Ottoman government and say, please, can we do this work here? No, we're not the British government, really. No, not really. <laughs> and so we have that kind of independence of agency and our results are trustworthy. And so we build up this relationship of independence and reliability and so on and so forth. You cannot get away from the fact that, yeah, it's connected very, very much with a, a kind of um, an intelligence gathering operation. At a, at a kind of um, non, non-involvement level, if you see what I mean. And I mean, look, I think the Ottoman Empire knew this as well. I, come on, they're not stupid. You know, there, there are people involved in the PEF. We have uh, one of our chairmen, for example, Colonel Watson, is um, uh, in charge in Egypt, for heaven's sakes, at the same time as being a, a colonel in the British Empire, in the British military. So. You know, the, these, these lines are furry, and I think the Ottomans knew that as much as anyone else. But we weren't doing, to, for them, it was also useful for them. They got the information too. Probably one of the most influential work carried out by the PF is exactly the, the, uh, the survey of Palestine. And mm -hmm. some historians made an argument that this work kind of... Uh, brought back Palestine to Europe. It's true that already plenty of visitors were traveling back and forth, certainly at the beginning of the 19th century with uh, you know, much uh, faster means of transportation, Palestine was uh, uh, easier to reach. But certainly the survey of Palestine that was published in, in, in all major publications revived interest uh, in the region. Uh, some scholars and Palestinian scholars, for instance, argue that had also uh, led to sort of a, a growth in, you know, of a Zionist idea towards the, amongst the Jews because now they knew more about it. I mean, Palestine was no longer this uh, sort of dreamed land uh, or promised land, but actually it was on a map and yeah. they could read the names of, of uh, familiar locations. 
I think that's fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, after one of the aims of the PEF was to disseminate reliable information about the place. So it, it's it. Of course, it follows that if people have access to that information, then it's going to have an impact on their relationship with this part of the world. And it's no surprise that Thomas Cook, for example, was an early member. And we had a very close working relationship with Thomas Cook, who um, helped in certainly a little bit later organize, you know, acted as a kind of banker for the PEF in, uh, and um, helped with kind of the, some of the logistics for the excavations that were carried out. So, um, and where we went, he was able to make tours. <laughs> so it was very reciprocal. Um, and yes, I mean, the role of the PEF as a kind of influencer, if you like, um, is, is, um, uh, is interesting. I, I think that um, one thing I should say that kind of colors everything is that I think people think that we were much bigger, a much bigger organization than we ever have been. We were always scraping the barrel for money. Always, always, always. And if there's anything that kind of hints at a word of caution with this kind of colonial vision of the PEF as this grand organization, it's like, yeah, but if we had been quite so important, we wouldn't always have been so poor. <laughs> so I wonder how, I think we like to think of ourselves as very influential, and I think maybe that's the case, but I'm not sure how deep that influence was outside of certain communities, outside of certain demographics. Uh, I don't know. And the interesting thing is, um, I recently came across a letter written in 1903 by Robert McAllister, who was excavating at the time at Geza in, um, in, in, in Palestine. And he's writing back to the office and he's saying, you know, I don't think we should write an archaeological book about Geza because people just aren't interested in it. I think we need to write a short, popular biblical book about biblical Geza. And then they'll buy that. And then maybe they'll buy enough copies of that for us to do some more work at Geza. <laughs> and so there's, that's, that's the relationship. And I think that our influence to, change, to, to educate beyond what people want to know is, is, I'm afraid, probably fairly limited. Which brings me to, to ask a question about the impact of the PEF. I mean, is there any possibility uh, to sort of uh, get the sense of the impact among uh, particularly the British um, mm. of the work of the PEF? I mean, I, I understand that metrics uh, mm. are hard to <laughs> collect in relation to that. We don't have a number of likes or, you know, sort of engagements like we may have on Twitter and Facebook. But is there any sense, uh, you know, of the, of the impact that the PEF and its work in particular had on the British uh, towards the, so. the end of the 19th century? I think so, possibly, um, with some qualifications. Uh, we're actually going through our rather enormous and um, terrifying office archive as we speak, which is a project which is going to take a very long time, as you can imagine. And there are things in there that are very, very interesting about lectures, about um, who was giving spe speeches, how much money was coming in from those things, who were buying books, for example, um, sets of lantern slides sold, that kind of thing, which give you an idea about the different audiences that we were interacting with and how we were interacting with them. The other lot of material that could be really useful in this regard are newspaper clippings, um, because we hired an agency to go through all the newspapers, clipping out things that were related to the PEF or of interest to the PEF. And so we've got quite a decent archive of newspaper clippings. And in there, you get a bit of the story. On the one hand, we seem to be terribly important and terribly busy, but also we're always, always, always asking for money. This business about our poverty comes back again and again and again. So, yeah, sure, people want to know, but do they want to dig their hands in their pockets? Nah. <laughs> no, never. So, yeah, I have a feeling that if we make the, the problem was and our enduring problem is that, you know, people were expecting, as I said earlier, the glories of Solomon and that never happened. And so I think people began to lose interest. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I guess that's the, the similar story of many similar organizations that uh, they, they may become very public and visible, but it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, public funding or you know private donations and so forth. And so, yeah, I, I guess the PF joins a, a large number of similar organizations. We all love to read about uh, archaeological excavations, but uh, when we think about uh, who's going to pay for that uh, for those excavations, then it's a different story. Exactly. Uh, so I, I want to move to talk about some of the uh, key figures of the PF. You already mentioned so, I mean, Warren and others, but I'm, I'm very interested and fascinated by the women of the uh, Exploration Fund, because uh, personally, I, I lived in Jerusalem for quite a while, and uh, often I lived in the Kenyan Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously connected to the sort of uh, British Archaeological School, and uh, here we're talking about not just Kenyan, you know, the famous archaeologist, but also his wife, uh, who was part of the um, Catlin Kenyan that was obviously part of the PF. And she's not the only woman. You already mentioned uh, Angela Budakut, but there are others. And I was wondering, you know, what was the role of these women in the PF? Uh, it was just uh, administrators, uh, public face? Or they also engage in the, the job of digging and mapping Palestine? I think early on, the, the answer is they are fundraisers, they are organizers. The other person who's important early on is a lady called Elizabeth Finn. She's the wife of the consul. And so she has um, obviously links to the, um, the Christian mission in Jerusalem. She's part of that, that, in that, that community there. Um, she was very influential in um, supporting photographers in Jerusalem. So she's connected with that side of the PEF's work. And she used to run Our Ladies Association, whatever, in, in terms of, it's interesting that it was felt that there would be a separate organization for the ladies. <laughs> it's, it's a slightly um, alien concept now, I think. And um, they would have tea in her front room and that's the way that she got the word of the PEF out to ladies who would then presumably join the organization and so on. Um, as time goes on, the actual practical involvement in the PEF by, of women grows. Um, it follows the trajectory of society. Um, so during the war, for example, um, the um, secretary, was um, a chap called, um, uh, oh gosh, what was his name? Um, Ovenden. And he went off to fight and his, uh, his, his seat was kept warm by Miss Estelle Blythe, who was, I think, the daughter of Bishop Blythe. So she came from that very established Anglican community in Jerusalem. Um, she was, she's an interesting person. I don't know as much as I should about her. She is emerging in that office archive I told you about more and more. And I hope that in due course, we'll be able to um, piece together more about her. She authored some books. She was particularly interested in the Crusader era in, uh, in Palestine and in Jerusalem. And she authored a few books on that subject. Um, she also made donations to our collections um, of photographs, of um, uh, sometimes antiquities. We have an enormous amphora from Gaza, which was donated by her. And she was very much involved in the day-to-day -day running of the PEF in that First World War period. And then after that, when Ovenden came back, she became uh, a fixture on our committee. So she was involved in the, um, in the policy uh, uh, end of things. Um, in the mandate period, uh, the role of women grows a lot. Um, and I think that, again, you have the situation after the First World War, where you have a lot of very well-educated women um, who, who, who are at, at a bit of a loose end, because a lot of men have died in the war, and you have a lot of spinsters, Miss Marple kind of situation, I suppose you could say. And so you have people who might otherwise have got married and then not have been quite so visible, becoming more visible in that period. And I'm thinking of people like Olga Tufnell, Kathleen Kenyon, uh, the Crowfoot sisters, uh, Dorothy Garrard, all sorts of people like that who see archeology span and go into archeology span as an 
a real career, not necessarily because um, they've all got they've all got private finances behind them. Bear that in mind. They're not making a living out of this, but it is what they are doing with their lives. I think mean, this is an, an interesting uh, point to make. That exactly. I mean, they 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 were covered in terms of uh, uh, you know finances, so this was not really the uh, job as uh, breadwinner in a sense. Uh, sort of speaking, but certainly, you know, they had the possibility to engage in the activity that they uh, liked. Uh, I was wondering, you know, how did people react to the fact that there were women digging? Is there any sense of this uh, sort of new figure emerging, uh, coming out from the archives or the British press or, you know, local reactions to uh, the fact that there are women on the ground, which was certainly unusual? New, different. Yeah. Um, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know enough. I'm thinking about Olga Tufnell's archive, which we've we've got and has been well thoroughly researched and um, well organised. And you don't get the feeling that there is um, that they're almost like they're in this in this um, uh, uh, highly um, regarded position. They're not like the local women, they're not like their wives and their daughters and their sisters. And they're not quite like the, the, the men either. They're in this kind of rarefied world where in fact, that gives them a certain amount of flexibility to behave in, in a way which actually is more free than even white men would have. Because as women, they could have access to that female world as well as the male world. And so in a way, Western women working in archeology span and also anthropology, really importantly in anthropology, possibly have the best time of all in terms of then their ability to move within Middle Eastern society. That's fascinating. And just because you mentioned earlier, the figure of uh, Elizabeth Finn, uh, Elizabeth mm -hmm. Finn, as you mentioned, was the, the wife of the uh, British consul and uh, I, I guess uh, the opinion of many scholars is that she definitely outsmarted uh, the husband, given that she spoke a large number of languages. She was uh, trained in various disciplines, um, and she was a very interesting figure. From my perspective, I remember working a little bit on her because she was also connected to the London Jew Society, which Correct. brought yes. eventually together various organizations together. Uh, even though that failed as a society, this idea of... Uh, creating a Christian organization to convert uh, uh, local Jews. But still, it's very interesting how she was able to bring uh, uh, sort of a diplomatic core, the PF, uh, the London Jew Societies, all of these organizations together, basically. Uh, so she's a very fascinating uh, yes, figure. Indeed. Indeed. And she has a lot of kind of uh, missionary work going on as well, you know, the health and uh, with, with uh, health care and so her interests are very broad. And I think that that's something that's very true for a lot of women of her kind of social standing is that they will have lots of interests. And yes, and she outlived her husband, of course, by quite some years. And so she was she was her own woman for a long time. Yeah, she nearly, she lived uh, nearly under that, if I remember well. She yeah. died right after World War One, So definitely a long life also to see the changes that occurred in Palestine and eventually to see Palestine becoming British. Yeah. As we move forward towards the end of our conversation, I want to ask you something about the legacy of the PF. The PF essentially stopped its operations at some point in Palestine, but the organization and the building still exist. And so I was wondering if you can give us a sense of what is uh, the legacy or how the legacy of the work of the PF is understood today. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, times have changed. And, you know, the PEF has changed with those times. Running a, a, an archaeological dig now is even more expensive than it was in Warren's time. So, and the situation is, is much more complicated. So what we do now, we fund um, field work and also post field work um, production as it works. So publication costs and lab costs. We... Um, we have a wonderful collection of material here, huge archives, um, some archeological material, ethnographic material, photographs, maps, reports, letters, 
all the information which goes to uh, give a really three-dimensional picture about what the PEF was doing in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and that as a resource for anyone is, is uh, invaluable. We don't have it up online at the moment. We have a database project, which unfortunately COVID kind of interfered with, but it is on track now. And I hope that gradually over the next however many years, more of our archives will make it up on a database which will be accessible to everybody in some shape or form. Meanwhile, you can have a look at some of our material on the Museum with No Frontiers, for example, and also other um, uh, outlets like the Watercolour World, where the watercolours of uh, Claude Conder, William Simpson, and yes, Elizabeth Finn can be seen for all to see, which is wonderful. Um, so uh, yeah, we are now based in Greenwich um, on the front of uh, the River Thames overlooking Canary Wharf, and it's a lovely day today. Um, and we have been here in this present building since 2018. So we moved from central London to this new, very new building in 2018 and have been unpacking our boxes and getting ourselves in shape ever since COVID willing. I was wondering if you can give us a sense of the difference between the material you may have in your archives and the publications, the official publications of the PF which I suppose are the most common amongst historians, starting with myself. So what you get in the archives, let's take uh, the Survey of Western Palestine, for example. The archive that we have for that is huge, and it doesn't just consist of what ends up in the publications. It also consists of the letters from those in the field back to the PEF saying, the weather is frightful and I've got a horrible cold and I hate it and I want to come home. And... I can't stand him and all of those things and all of the human uh, elements which makes uh, it such an interesting uh, archive. The, the personalities who, you know, the relationships between these people, who likes who, who really doesn't like so-and-so and how they're organized and how they're working or not working together is what makes the story of all of these um, projects. They're not just, faceless individuals anymore. The archives in the PF bring these people very much to life in warts and all, all their prejudices, all their faults, all their immense capabilities as well. So you begin to see them as real people, as real voices, and not just as cardboard cutouts. The latest work on the PF, the latest major work was published, I think, in 2000 by uh, John Moscrop, Measuring Jerusalem, the Palestine Exploration Fund and British interest in the Holy Land. Do you think that 20 years later uh, would be possible to write a different history of the funds? Or yes. given the material and our understanding, we are more or less, uh, you know, yeah, sort of on the same so. ground? I think so. I think there will be some similarities, but I think that, um, I mean, if I may say so, I think that there was a certain um, argument that was being pushed there, which I think was a bit um, one dimensional. I think that the work that has gone in in our archives subsequently um, means that you can you can bring out the nuances and you can bring out the subtleties of these relationships and the different cogs and the wheels that are spinning around because the PEF, as I said before, is never one thing. It's lots of things, lots of things to lots of different people all at the same time. And what's in dominance and what comes to the fore is always, always shifting. So for example, the whole colonial issue and our involvement, are we a, you know, basically a kind of our man in Jerusalem sort of thing? That's far more true in the late 19th century than it is in the mandate period. Why? Because the Brits are in charge. They don't need us for them to find out what's there because they're there. So our business in, in, in providing information to the British government just dis disappears overnight. Yeah, I guess that, uh, that's, a very, that's a valid argument. In the end, the British took over, so they no longer need the services of uh, an unofficial branch because now they are in charge. And oh, they but essentially... we're still here. Exactly. So therefore, our, our raison d'etre is broader than that colonial agenda. And in that case, then the PF could actually revert to, a, I would say, full uh, archaeological work without any political dimension attached yes. to it. I think many people probably breathed a sigh of relief. I can imagine that. I have one last question. 
you know, our conversation moved through uh, various aspects of APF. But I was wondering if there's anything that I didn't ask, but you mm. feel passionate about and you want to talk about that. I would say, uh, yeah, I think what, what I try and do, and my colleagues with me here, what we try and do is we, we are, um, I think, very passionate about making the PEF an organization for anyone and everybody. So it's not about being British. It's certainly not about um, serving one uh, ideological purpose or another. It's not about just serving the academic community. It's about being an organization which is approachable and has something for everyone. So if you want to get involved, just let me know. This was uh, Felicity Cobbing, Chief Executive and Curator at the Palestine Exploration Fund. And certainly uh, I will post uh, the link to their amazing website, which has plenty of information and amazing pictures of Palestine and Jerusalem. Felicity, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks and I'll see you next time.